Good evening, and thank you for being with us tonight. My name is Davalyn Patrick, and I work with Children's Special Health and Families Helping Families of Southwest Louisiana. We are pleased to welcome our special guest, Fonda, today. She is an occupational therapist and educator, and today she'll be sharing with us full information about how taking breaks can benefit our milk. I want to make you aware that this part is being recorded. Vonda will also be answering questions at the end of her presentation. You can send to us by entering, into, entering them into the chat box. For the purposes of sound quality, one will be muted for today's webinar. I'll let you know that when we finish this webinar, you will be prompted to complete a post-event survey. With that, I want to welcome my very special friend, Vonda. You're muted, Vaughn. Sorry. Perfect. Okay, let me try this again. <laughs> Thank you for allowing me to speak. As Davalyn said, I'm an occupational ther therapist and a health and wellness educator. Um, I really love health and I like looking at both sides of health, both physical and mental. So um, I'm an OT with about 27 years of experience and um, I work at the Therapeutic Writing Center in Sulphur, Louisiana, part of West Calcasieu Cameron Hospital. And I also work at um, Louisiana United Methodist Children's Home, which is also located in Sulphur, Louisiana. So I know that this is a topic that probably we know that we should take um, breaks, mental health breaks for productivity and clarity. But I just thought I'd share some information that I'd found and some um, things to look at and think about to help you take those breaks. Because many of us know that we should be taking the breaks, but a lot of times we don't. We, we push through and want to finish the task. So I'm gonna read this disclaimer. I'm not diagnosing or recommending treatment for any conditions or diagnoses. I am going to suggest movements that can be done during rest breaks, but you're responsible to check with your physician or other medical professional to safely implement any of the suggestions in this webinar. The information provided is for educational purposes only. So. All right, I am going to um, you know, talk about our productivity. We all want to be productive and keep going, but um, we can't, unfortunately. We are not machines that can go for long, long, long periods of time without a rest break. Um, even machines, though, that can go very long periods of time without a rest break do still require one because we know that um, your computer will start glitching or getting slow if you don't turn it off every once in a while, um, as will your phone will do the same thing. I remember one time when I brought it in, my phone in several years ago, after the smartphones had just come out, and the guy says, do you turn it up? Yeah, when's the last time you turned it off? And I was like, never. He's like, okay, let's do this. And he told me, so this is a miniature computer, a mini computer, basically, that you have in your hand. So set a, um, uh, two couple of days a week and turn it off. So I decided it was Mondays and I mean Sundays and Wednesdays and I would turn it off just those two times. He said, just turn it off and turn it back on. So the point I'm trying to make is, is even if something that's a machine needs a break every once in a while, you need one more often than every once in a while. So, all right, but we live in a fast paced society. We like things done quickly. Um, we typically use microwaves in most homes in our country, even though there is a plethora of information on how microwaves kill the nutrients in your food, and it's not good, it damages your food. We still use those. Um, unfortunately, um, fast food is not the most nutritious, and I'm saying that, you know, it's just not noted to be that, but we, we thrive off of that, and we have lots of those in our country. So we really value time, um, a lot. We really want to get the task done. So I am currently also reading a book on leprosy patients. Dr. Philip Brand um, and, Dr. and Philip Yancey wrote the book together. And um, he talks about, and there was a leprosy clinic, I believe it's closed right now, in Carville, Louisiana. And he talks about these people have problems sensing pain. So they will do things that end up damaging life or limb, literally. And so they spent, I don't know how many millions, um, Dr. Brand brought together engineers and other scientific people and they developed a glove for the hand that would, close as they could get it, to reproduce some pain signals to the person by flashing a light 
or um, a sound. And that would tell them they're doing a repetitive task that's putting too much pressure on, on one area. And, you know, they would eventually get like a pressure ulcer or something. And with the interesting thing that Dr. Brand found was that most of the time it didn't work. Not because the machine, the glove um, that went over the hand didn't work, because basically most of the time they would turn the machine off and finish their task. So it's very interesting that even physical harm didn't deter them from task completion. So what I want to talk to tonight to you tonight about is why do we value task completion so highly that we won't stop and take a break, even if it is um, detrimental to our health. And I think that basically we value the time. We want to keep going. Um, we actually don't gain when we push through something. We think we do in the short term, but in the long term, there's a lot of physical that, um, problems that we will have. I'm so sorry. Truck goes by. There are a lot of physical problems that we have in the long run. So, um, you know, you're going to have someone like a massage therapist that may have to work the kinks out or physical therapy or occupational therapy um, may have to, to help out when you push beyond your limits. And that is not only time um, costly, but it's time consuming. You either have to leave work and go do it or do it on your own time. And some people say, well, I can't afford those things. I'll just go home and drop. Well, that's time as well. And then I explain this a lot at work. Well, the body does not like extremes, highs and lows. So if you do a task completion and you work, 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 and you're just way up here and you're stressed out and then you go and you bottom out and you just say, I'm going to just totally relax and your body has to recover. And it usually is an equal amount. So let's say this is just baseline right here and um, you, you spike up and you do your task and you're way up here. Your body, I'm going to try to show this this way, your body goes almost the exact amount down to recover because it has to re recover the resources that you use in that stressful event. So let's say while you're down there, you have another stressful event, something happens, it comes along and spikes up and you're high and you got a lot of stress in your system and then it goes back down again. Well, what you've done over the day is you've ridden this roller coaster, <laughs> um, this emotional, physical roller coaster of all your resources. And then at the end of the day, at the end of the week, you're really extra depleted. Does that make sense? Um, so the, that's hard on the body. Um, think about anybody with a condition like diabetes. If they're always going up and down, nobody wants that. That's, again, hard on the body. So those extremes, highs and lows, and going in between them can be, again, hard on the body. So we want to get that closer into what I tell people. We're going to have some highs and lows during the day, but we want them to go um, up and down like a gentle motion, almost like a porpoise um, in the ocean without the jumping, I guess. So I'm going to um, switch over and share to my um, slide the PowerPoint, and I want to go over a few things with that. So let me get to it here. All right, can you see it okay? We got you. Okay. All right. And here's the thing I said in the beginning that please consult your physician for any of the things that are going to be suggested in this webinar. So the value of task completion. Why is task completion so important that we will suffer harm, sometimes irreparable harm to ourselves in both the short term and or long term? We value time over health. But with that stress, we have this hormone that comes in our body called cortisol. And cortisol is, oops, sorry, I'm going to go back. This is a wonderful article. I've referenced it in the um, handout you're going to get. Um, the stress hormone cortisol, it's what prepares us for fight or flight, okay, um, is public health enemy number one. Scientists have known for years that elevated cortisol levels interfere with learning and memory. It lowers immune function and bone density, increases weight gain, blood pressure, cholesterol, heart disease. The list goes on and on. But did you see that first part? Interferes with learning and memory. Chronic stress and elevated cortisol levels also in increase risk for depression, mental illness, and lower life expectancy. This week, two separate studies were published in Science linking elevated cortisol levels as a potential trigger for mental illness and decreased resilience, especially in adolescents. 
Cortisol is released in response to fear or stress by the adrenal glands as part of the fight or flight mechanism. The fight or flight mechanism is part of the general adaptation syndrome as defined in 1936 by Canadian biochemist Hans Hans Selye of McGill University in Montreal. He published his revolutionary findings in a simple 74 line article in Nature in which he defined two types of stress. Eustress, which is good stress, and distress, which is bad stress. Both eustress, the good stress, and the distress, bad stress, both of them release cortisol as part of the general adaptation syndrome. Once the alarm to release cortisol has sounded, your body becomes mobilized and ready for action, okay? But there has to be a physical release for fight or flight. So we're getting ready for something. So your body does what it needs to do. It does what it um, is supposed to do, releases those hormones. Otherwise, cortisol, but there has to be a physical release of fight or flight. Otherwise, cortisol levels build up in the body, which wreaks havoc on your mind <clears throat> and your body. You stress, a seize the day, heightened state of arousal, is invigorating and often linked with a tangible goal. Cortisol returns to normal upon the completion of the task. Distress or free-floating anxiety doesn't provide an outlet for the cortisol and causes the fight or flight mechanism to backfire. Ironically, our own biology, which is designed to ensure our survival as hunters and gatherers, is sabotaging our bodies and minds in a sedentary age. All right. There's another one. Cortisol releases a trigger, uh, another article, releases, triggers the release of sugar into the glucose into the bloodstream. So cortisol increases the amount of glucose in the bloodstream, which supplies sugar to muscles. Also, cortisol inhibits inflammation and suppresses the immune response. With long-term overstimulation, cortisol causes a wide range of negative effects. It causes deposit, deposition of fat in the stomach and the face promotes face and promotes a breakdown of muscle, bone, and connective tissues to create glucose. Various scientific studies have shown that chronic stress can also increase the risk of high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, elevated lipid levels. Stress also impairs memory and interferes with learning. So here we're talking about you know, mental breaks for increased clarity and um, productivity, and guess what? <laughs> Stress also impairs memory and interferes with learning. So the basically the goal is to go back to, um, I think I can just pause. The, basically, the goal is to go back to not having those huge spikes and ups and up and downs of stress, and it's just overwhelming, and you feel it all over. It's to take, you know, there's some stress, take some suggestions. We're going to talk at the end of the seminar if you're if you can, and just make that um, gentle motion, like a wave in the ocean. Okay, so that's the goal. I think I need to try to go forward here. Okay, chronic stress can even damage and can, can even cause damage to an area of the brain called the hippocampus that is important for memory. Consumption of caffeine and lack of adequate sleep has been found to increase cortisol secretion. Okay, so over time, pushing and pushing to get that job done is going to wear down on your body. Um, what can you do? Research shows that breaks lead to aha moments. A study from Stanford University showed that when people task tackled mental tasks that required imagination, walking led to more creativity, creative thinking than sitting did. You know, maybe we should all get treadmills at our desk. But <laughs> it actually was, and they actually in this study talked about whether they were inside or outside. And it said they found that participants who walked, whether indoors or out, came up with more creative responses than those who sat. In other words, there seems to be something specific about the act of walking that got people's creative juices flowing. Harvard Business, Business Review examines another prime benefit of breaks. They allow us to take a step back and make sure we're accomplishing the right things in the right way. When you work on a task continuously, it's easy to lose focus and get lost in the weeds. In contrast, Following a brief intermission, but picking up where you left off forces you to take a few seconds to think globally, like, okay, what was I doing? What, why, did, why was I here? Why did I, where did I stop? What's the information before this? Or about, you know what I'm saying? You, you take a few seconds and think globally about what you're ultimately trying to achieve. It's a practice that encourages to stay mindful of our objectives. Okay, so second thought. 
Why does it lost time, money, health, or even lost productivity deter us from knowingly harming ourselves? Okay, so that may seem like a little bit of an odd answer, but hear me out. Identity. We are taught things like toughen it out, quit complaining and get to the work. I will sleep when I die. Unfortunately, that what that teaches us subconsciously is that our time, money, and health are less important. Sayings such as these teach us that hard work means being hard on ourselves. And unfortunately, we get positive rewards and feedbacks with sayings such as these, way to push through the pain. It may take us a lifetime to recover, but we got the job done. We treat our moving parts more like machines, except that we are not machines. Machines are not designed to do repetitive tasks for hours on the end, but even a machine breaks down just like humans. The longer the damage goes unheeded, the more significant the damage to even the machine. Many people say that maybe being a machine would be easier because the job would do, be done with uniformity and efficiency. Here's our identity point here. That desire is a moot point because you are human. <laughs> Knowing that you are human with delicate or limited pieces means that if you value yourself, your time, your money, and your productivity, you will take time to be proactive so that cl increased clarity keeps you moving in the right direction. There will be many times you will have to choose and human reconstruction professions like massage therapy, myself, occupational speech are filled to the brim with people who didn't listen to messages from their body. Unfortunately, in our society, we're not often taught to listen to those messages that said, hey, this task we need to stop at. That's the same problem they were having with the people with leprosy, um, that they didn't have the feedback to say, stop, something's being damaged. I know it was very uh, evident when I was pulling some weeds in the garden in the middle of reading just that section in that book. And, and my wrist kind of had a tweak, uh, twinge in it. It kind of hurt a little bit when I reached and pulled something out of the weeds. And I thought, mm, I'm not going to grip that the same time, way again, or I'm going to pay attention because was that a one-time fluke or was that going to keep hurting? But they don't have that feed me feedback mechanism. Okay, here's another article. When, when demand in our lives intensifies, we tend to hunker down and push harder. Um, the trouble is that without any downtime to refresh and recharge, we're less efficient, make more mistakes, and get in less engaged with what we're doing. Idleness is not just a vacation or an indulgence or a vice. It is as indispensable to the brain as vitamin D is to the body. And deprived of it, we suffer a mental affliction as disfiguring as rickets. It is paradoxically necessary to um, get any work done. Okay, so now I'm going to go over something a little bit different to give you a help on a feedback mechanism. It's called the zones of regulation. Um, um, I do not have, I have some handouts that I'm going to show, um, or one handout I'm going to show in a minute, and you can download that one for free. It's on the handout that I'll be giving to Families Helping Families, but it's on their website. There's three um, handouts that they allow you to download. It's a framework and easy to use curriculum for teaching students strategies for emotional and sensory self-management. Thing is, is when I found this, I thought this is great for everybody. Rooted in cognitive behavioral therapy, the zones approach uses four colors to help students identify how they are feeling in the moment, given their emotions and level of alertness, as well as to guide them to strategies to support regulation. By understanding how to notice their body signals, what I was just talking about, pay attention to what, you know, detect triggers, read social context, and consider how their behavior impacts those around them, students learn improved emotional control, sensory regulation, self-awareness, and problem-solving abilities. But you know what? As an adult, don't I need that? Don't I need to detect triggers, um, listen to my body, read social context, and then consider how my behavior is impacting those around me? And, you know, so it was great. Um, oh. Sorry, they're using a cognitive behavioral approach. I thought this was a quick sentence, I guess not. The curriculum's learning activities are designed to help students recognize when they are in different states or zones with each of the four zones represented by a different color. So the red zone is used to describe extremely heightened states of alertness and intense emotions. A person may be elated. So that's one of the things I teach um, my patients is that, you know, it's not just angry. So yes, there may be experiencing anger, rage, explosive behavior, devastation, or terror when in the red zone, but they also could be so excited and euphoric and they're bouncing off the walls or they're bouncing into people or they're bumping into people or they're dropping their glass. So it's actually... I like this because it's both sides. It's not just a negative connotation. We can be so excited that we're unaware of what's going on around us as well. The yellow zone is also is used to describe a heightened state of alertness and elevated emotions. However, individuals have more control when they are in the yellow zone. A person may be experiencing stress, frustration, anxiety, excitement, silliness, the wiggles, or nervousness when in the yellow zone. 
The green zone is used to describe a state of calm state of alertness. A person may be described as happy, focused, content, or ready to learn when in the green zone. This is the zone where optimal learning occurs. And then what I liked about this one that was different is it has a blue zone and it's used to describe low states of alertness and down feelings, such as when one feels sad, tired, sick, or bored. All of the zones are natural to experience, but the framework for framework focuses on teaching students how to recognize and manage their zone based on the demands of their environment and the people around them. So here's the, um, or who can teach it? Anyone wanting to help individuals improve their self-regulation skills, Obviously it's included, but not limited to special and regu regular education teachers, occupational therapists, speech language pathologists, psychologists, counselors, beha um, behaviorists, social workers, and parents who can benefit. It can you know, target students who struggle with self-regulation. Initially it was developed considering the needs and learning styles of students with neurobiological and mental health disorders, such as autism spectrum, spectrum levels one and two, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, Tourette Syndrome, Oppositional Defiant Disorder, Conduct Disorder, Selective Mutism, Anxiety Disorder. However, the curriculum now reaches a much broader population spanning students of, and adults of various levels of learning inside and outside of the educational environment. Last little bit I want to say about it is that um, everybody, you know, experiences difficulties in self-regulation, but it's consistent. It's uses common language. I really liked it. Um, you can do it for regular education um, uh, teachers. And it's also to be designed for your a kids ages four um, through adulthood. Okay. And here's a picture of it. So as I was talking to, like I said, I talked to my patients, the blue zone is not something, I mean, like I said, we need to let them know that yes, it's not a state for optimal for learning, um, but you may be sad sometimes and just knowing that you're sad helps out, but you know that sad is not necessarily the optimal zone for, for learning. But when you get up in the morning, you may be tired or moving slowly. Again, that's probably normal, but it's not the optimal state for learning. And then I like that the red, yellow, green goes with like a traffic light signal. So um, green is happy, calm, feeling okay, focused, ready to learn. Yellow is struggling, frustrated, worried, silly, wiggly, excited, loss of some control. And then red, you're mad, angry, terrified, yelling, hit it, hitting, elated, so happy, but you're still out of control. And I was talking with someone, they said, you know, you might bypass that green zone and you go from tired and moving slowly and someone says hey we have to leave we have to you know your parents say we have to go we have to go to an appointment this morning and we have to go somewhere else and then whoop next thing you know you're you might have even bypass yellow and you're in the red <laughs> you know and so um anyways that's just a really neat chart that i thought i would share with you guys because i think it can help us as adults as well as with kids or when you're working with your kids. We have a lot of, you know, homeschooling going on, not well, it's homeschooling, but schooling at home going on with the kids and everything. And so um, there's, there's, there's ways to where you can point out and say, hey, what zone are you in? What color are you in? And colors are really e easy, especially younger kids because they know the stoplight and you can explain that as you're traveling down the road. Visuals help kids learn more. Okay, so there was that. Um, then this is some of the things I was thinking out that, about. Basically, there's a lot of different um, times that you can take breaks, but one of the things, if you do five every five, 55, for every hour, take five minutes out of that hour to recharge somehow, somehow. Just take five. So then what happens is you're doing those, I've, I've been kind of working for that 55 minutes and then I can kind of take a lull and it keeps you from getting three hours of, I haven't taken a break. So deep breathing. All right, I'm gonna stop my screen share here. Um, and I'm going to show you a technique that I use um, to teach. And it's on my webpage if you wanna look at it. Vonda Flu, VondaFlu.com. And I have some um, other videos for occupational therapy tips. So what I do is I take a, um, I, I get them to inhale and exhale. I do double the exhale. That's just the way I teach it. And um, so you can, I've heard, heard people do equal amounts, like four second inhale, four second exhale, and you know, just whatever you feel like it works well for you. But I like to do a longer exhale. Um, so they typically, the saying we used to do was smell the roses and flutter the candle. That's great for adults. <laughs> when I was working with the adult population, that's great um, because they can understand that. Smell the roses, flutter the candle. 
sometimes teens can understand that, but not often and not if they're like a guy, um, a male, that's harder for them to understand. So, um, so anyways, this is what I do. I um, use scent aroma because it's in the, my domain of practice as far as sensory integration. So I, they love to smell of things. So um, you can use some, I have an essential oil here. This is stress away. And so what we do is, is they, they, and when I tell them to exhale slowly and make a very small hole, like a straw, they tend to still, they have this very wide gaping mouth. They just don't visually know, maybe not getting feedback from their mouth. But it's so funny that everybody closes their mouth really, or I say everybody, but most everybody knows when you're blowing bubbles, you make a very, very small opening to make the bubbles. So I don't even have to teach it if I use these techniques. So they will inhale for three seconds. And then they will blow the bubbles. Oh, it's seven seconds. <laughs> Okay, and what I like to use is this. I'm gonna let it pop. I like to use a um, wand for a bubble. I have a very big tube here, um, tub of bubbles here to get that has three circles in it because then if I tell them to blow a bubble in all three circles, they tend to go close to, close to six seconds. And then what I do is after a while, I say, okay, I want you to um, not inhale this. I just want you to inhale through your nose and I want you to blow the bubbles. And then, so I take away one part of it. And then, then I take away the bubbles and I say, I'll just want you to right here, just inhale and exhale. And I use these so I don't disturb them. I use a count with my fingers. You did that three second inhale, now let's do a six second exhale. And they do it, okay? So we're gonna practice that right now. You may not have your um, thing to smell, your essential oil, you may not have bubbles, but we're gonna practice it. And I'm going to do it. And then you can, um, you can watch or you can count for yourself, okay? So. Inhale, smelling the roses, take a nice deep aroma in, and you're gonna exhale for three seconds and exhale for six seconds. Ready? I actually encourage them if they can go longer, they could, they could go for nine seconds. So I don't know if any of you can, but let's triple it and see if we can inhale for three seconds and exhale for nine seconds. Ready? I'm still <laughs> exhaling there. Um, you really can train that. And that long exhale is really, really good. And I show them, I say, listen, when you're stressed, here, you're taking shallow breaths, but when you go to the beach, you go, yes. <sighs> and you make that long exhale, that signifying relaxation. So it's really, really good. So all right, I'm gonna go back to screen share after we practice that one. And as you can see, it. Oh, I want to point something else out. When you purposely take a long breath, a nice calm one, but you're not feeling relaxed, your body still gets a, a, a signal of why. Why is she not stressed though? Why is she not stressed? She's relaxed. The danger must have gone. Everybody can settle down because she's breathing back to normal. Like there's no danger around. Like the deadline has gone. <laughs> You know, and so your, your cells hear that message, even though your deadline's not gone and the stress may not be gone, you have to practice that and teach your body to listen to what you're actually telling it. Um, okay, so we're going to go back to screen share. So the next one. Movement. Do the opposite posture of movement as possible. Again, I refer back to what I said in the beginning. You know, you have to um, be under a physician's guidance if you um, are undertaking any of these. But this is what I'm saying. If you have a posture that's forward and you're over a desk or um, as an occupational therapist, I spend time maybe working on people's, uh, you know, their shoulder or they're massaging the scar on their hand or doing something. And I'm always bent forward, then what I would want to do is get into either an upright, very, very upright posture or lean backwards a little bit. Um, I used to love to lay out, um, you know, backwards over a Swiss ball. Again, if you can do that, but even if you can't get into the totally opposite posture, get out of that forward posture. Um, we, I learned long ago when 
first started as an occupational therapist that your head weighs about much as a bowling ball. So you're at like anywhere from eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 pounds um, for that. And so when you lean it forward all the time, it really puts a lot of strain on your back. And as your body starts aching, you decrease in your clarity because sometimes you're like I, I just can't think I'm like my shoulders are hurting so bad or my my back is hurting so bad um, pay attention to the posture that you're in a lot of us get into those forward postures even when we don't need to I notice that how many of us brush our teeth while we're bit over the sink you know it should be for two minutes you know can you kind of hold that in your mouth and just keep brushing with your uh with your body upright and then lean over and spit out you know, we tend to be forward a lot of times when we can't. Another thing is um, rotation. You know, if you're always forward, you know, move to the, rotate to the side of your, your body. Um, I'm going to show, stop screen share again. So rotate, you know, looking behind you a little bit helps that spine move in a different direction. Um, so that's the opposite movement, if possible. The other one is, we call it ocular lock. When you look at a screen all the time, your eyes are what, what we call convergence and they're looking and they're staring and they, your body is very, very, very still and quiet because if your body's moving, you can't see the screen as well. So you get all frozen here. So that's why you could move your trunk, your um, core of your body a, a good bit, but your eyes are also locked. The muscles aren't moving very much. They're moving on the screen, which is a very small amount. So what you wanna do is you wanna look up and away, hopefully out of window, which is divergence. Convergence means your eye muscles come together and you can read a book or screen, but you look up and you look hopefully out the window, you look at the tree far away. If not, I tell people, if you don't have a window next to you, look as far across the room as possible and then track your eyes from one side to the other. Let them go from one side of the room to the other so they're not stuck. So you're still not staring at something that's stuck. Um, anytime you can go outside, Look at the tops of the trees, look in the sky for different things, because again, that's the opposite movement of what you've been doing. You've been probably taking shorter breaths, go back to taking um, longer breaths, okay? Next one is mindlessness. I just love this one when I found it. <laughs> For any of you all that know, um, I like English and I like poetry. And one of my favorite poems is "I've Wander uh, Wandering Lonely as is Wandering Lonely as a Cloud" by Williams Wadsworth. And um, I won't read it to you right now. I, I'm, I tried to memorize a lot of it when I was younger. But daydreamer engage in a mindless task. And I thought that was kind of funny because I don't really recommend this, but they said, even if you wanted to even scroll past Facebook or play that game on Facebook, it's a mindless type task and it would help, which <laughs> some of people do, but um, that's still screen time. So that doesn't help the visual component. It doesn't help being very still. You need to get up and actually move. But I found this, I love Dr. Caroline Leaf. Um, and she says, she, I, this was just recently, boredom is your be brain's best friend. When you let yourself be bored, your mind goes into a decluttering and cleaning mode. It's in those moments that we can find creative solutions to problems and recall important moments or facts that may help solve an issue. Don't be afraid of empty spaces of empty space and silence. Now, sitting in front of the TV is not uh, I'm bored because you're still getting information in and you're not being able to declutter, but walking. There was one article that talked about for your and I I'm going to quote in a minute, your creative juice is flowing for writers is huge when you're walking. And they said, Williams Wadsworth, who did lots of poetry, walked a lot. And so that's when you go, oh, you know what? That could help us. I forgot all about that because you're not, your, your wheels aren't gunked up and you can think differently. Um, meditation, um, you know, devote time to relaxing your mind and body. So mindlessness is more that mental, but meditation, you can also look, do in that time, you can actually go through and feel where your body is tense. I tend to hold, I was the other, the other night when I was working on this, I actually flipped part of the, the talk and put it in a different spot. And so I had, felt like I had a little stress. So I got up and I moved. And it was funny when I was pouring my glass of water, I still felt my shoulders elevated. And I stopped because, again, I'm wanting to pay attention to what my body's telling me. And I relaxed my shoulders and my, my hand that was holding the cup of water didn't move. It didn't interfere with anything, but I was stuck in that state. So think about where. Sometimes people say I have butterflies in my stomach. I, you know, my stomach's in knots. We hold stress in our stomach. We hold it in our shoulders. We hold it in our jaws. We're clenching when we're under tent pressure and, and upset. 
So pay attention to when you need to relax. Just laying down may not relax the body part that is holding the stress. And we hold it in different parts. Some of us get ulcers, some people get migraines. We hold it in different areas of our body. So I thought this was good. This is also on Dr. Caroline Leaf's page. What I thought would make me productive, hard work. What actually makes me productive? Exercise, healthy eating. Remember I talked about that earlier? Sleep, we talked about that earlier. Hard work is, is in there and it's the biggest slice of the pie. And time off. That actually makes you, like I say, those aha moments, that insight to when you get back to the hard work, you're more productive. You're thinking clearer because you stepped away and came back to it. I had to do that several times during this. And again, as a writer, I write on my page and blog and I write all kinds of other ways. When the creative juices are flowing, you, you think it's almost like writer suicide to, to stop because you're not gonna get back to it. You're not gonna get that creativity coming back to you. When actually, what they were saying in the article is you stop. I had to reread my paper again. And then I thought, you know what? This would sound better in the beginning instead of the end or a different part. And I had to do something differently um, when I came back to it and I actually stopped. And then this was funny for um, Calvin and Hobbes. Do you have an idea for your story yet? No, I'm waiting for inspiration. You can't just turn creativity on creativity like a faucet. You have to be in the right mood. What mood is that? Last minute panic. <laughs> I don't know if any of y'all have ever experienced that. Um, but this is another good article. Some studies have shown that the mind solves its stickiest problems while daydreaming. Something you may have experienced while driving or taking a shower. Breakthroughs that seem to come out of nowhere are often the product of diffuse thinking mode. I guess that's the, pretty much the opposite. If you think of the diffuser behind me, it's putting stuff everywhere instead of that specific task, one thing, you know, tunnel vision. That's because the relaxation associated with daydream can allow the brain to hook up and return valuable insights. Engineering professor Barbara Oakley explained to Mother Jones, this is part of an article, when you're focusing, you're actually blocking your access to the diffuse mode. And the diffuse mode, it turns out, is what you often need to be able to solve a very difficult new problem. Okay, so I hope some of that helps. And, and when you get the handout, <clears throat> if you wanna go to those actual articles, there are lots of other um, ways that you can stop and relax and um, have some mental breaks for your increased creativity and productivity. I loved a lot of their stuff, but I didn't want to rehash every one of them on this um, page. You can look those up yourself and see which ones would be right for you and which ones, like say specifically, if you um, need to consult with your doctor. Um, the Zones of Regulation actually has a page that I didn't include, but it's like I don't know if you can see it, but basically it was, here's the tools, so that's chair push-ups. How did it make you feel? Did that activity on the chair push-up, did it make you calmer, more awake, or no change? So this is good for a child to get feedback, or a kid, or even for an adult, yes, but it's really a good visual for a, for a, kid, a child. Um, the stress ball, what did it make you calmer, more awake, no change? Play-doh, you know, taking a walk and they get to rate it and they get to then say, hey, these are my activities when I'm in the red zone. These are my activities when I'm in the blue zone and I'm not ready for learning. Um, so again, I gave two pages actually, you know, like the bumpy seat, um, lazy eight breathing, counting to 10, Velcro on and off. What, how did it make me feel? So it's, that's another one of the tools there. And then the last page I think they gave for free was um, my, the three movements I felt whatever way when I did something and they can draw a picture there. So there's different ways to help the child do that. So um, anyways, I think that's pretty much it for my presentation. I hopefully wanted to build a case that you're worth it, your identity, you're a human, you're worth it, take some breaks, but don't be afraid that if you take those breaks, you're gonna lose valuable time. You're actually gonna keep your body in, in maintain, um, feeling good you're not going to like say spike and then just feel horrible but your brain doesn't want that so you're not going to do that and you're going to come back and you're going to oh, look at the whole thing again and you may have had a creative idea while you're away um, and you may have a new one when you read the whole thing or look at the whole thing and get a little bit global picture as to where you were when you left off and that's those aha moments. And I, last thing I'll add is, it was funny, I was talking to an older gentleman about this and it was a different scenario. But anyways, he goes, that's what those old men used to do. They would say, you know what? We need to stop and go have some coffee. And they stop, go have some coffee, come back. He said, and they solve it. And I thought, well, I'll add that to my story. Thank you <laughs> that I'm doing Friday night. So 
I have a lot of scientific evidence here that it's really good for you, but even that's something that, you know, obviously is just known. Take a break, come back. You're not going to lose your spot. You're going to feel better. And in the long run, it's going to be much better for you. So um, I will open it back up to Dave Leonard Wallace with Families Helping Families to see if we have any questions. Thank you so much for sharing with this, Fonda. Um, we'll take your questions now to those of you in the audience. If you've not already done so, please ask those in the chat box below. And we'll give you a few minutes to do that. I did um, a question. Would music be something that would be included in mindlessness? I guess it would maybe depend on what music or yeah. is it even official. Um, I use music at um, in my therapy. Uh, and I do use some with words and typically bass music is very calming. So um, it's very um, wholesome music and it has a, a, a beat, but they like that. And they like the bass music. That's that bone kind of jarring, you know, tapping and moving. That's what bass music feels like. But there are some um, like Tomatis Method and other those that work on some auditory processing. They use things like Mozart and Gregorian chants, and it doesn't have any of those. Um, there are some studies out that uses music with different frequencies. Right now I'm using the 285 HZ. That, I don't know what that stands for, <laughs> but I like that one and I tend to play it in the background. So yes, music can be very, very calming. Um, it's why we like to sing songs to stuff too. We'll hum it. It replays in our head. It's, and what's nice about music now, the, calm, the, the two parts of music, and I need to put this in, is if it's repetitive rhythm, it's calming. If it's uh, uneven, kind of like a jazz, um, it's, it's, up, it's alerting. It's upbeat. So jazz music, music may not. Now to some people it will, but obviously that's not typically what we give for calming because it's, you don't know what's coming and it's uneven, but people like that steady rhythm, that just that steady beat and that steady rhythm. Okay. We do have also, uh, a comment that the participants said that they really get their best ideas when they sleep. Yes. After, after having slept. Yes. Isn't it cool? So I mean, I, 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 I find that I'm going to say, I'm not going to say that it's frustrating because I don't want it to say that. I don't want to speak a negative, but I am working, I'm thinking and doing stuff. You know, you go to lay down and as soon as I lay down, my brain turns on <laughs> and it's not worry. It's not stress. I just think I used to for my patients all the time and they would laugh at me. I'd go into the clinic the next day and I was like, oh, Miss so-and-so, can we try this with your hand to see if it worked? Because this is what I was thinking about last night, right before I was went to sleep. And they're like, honey, why are you thinking about me? I'm like, that's when the brain works a lot. So sleep does help because again, it's just like what Dr. Caroline Leaf said with boredom, your brain can kind of declutter and it gets, you know, and when you're walking, think about how much your brain has to do. It has to see the visual danger on the floor, anywhere around you. It has to listen for danger. It has to detect danger in all the senses. So everything's working. So it can't, um, focus as well. But when all of that shuts down and you're bored or you're totally relaxed, then mental is occurring. And so, yes, it's a great time. Daydreaming. Let's say day, daydreaming and walking outside. The study you referenced about uh, um, the glove with the patients who had the just is fascinating. The idea that the tech is so much more important than the physical effect of ever just Yes. I, I don't think about that in relation to my kids, but I, I certainly will now. Yes. And actually Dr. Philip Brand called it the gift of pain. He said, because they don't have the gift of pain because he said, if we didn't have feedback in our body to tell us when we stop, we would be neurotic looking at ourselves all the time to wonder if we damaged. He said, we wouldn't get things accomplished, obviously, because we'd constantly be inspecting our feet, inspecting our hands, inspecting our hair, where we put our phone on there and say, did we damage it? He said, it's actually a great and wonderful gift that we've been given to have feedback from our body, but we tend to perceive pain as a very negative thing. Um, so it's a, it's an eye-opening book. It definitely sounds like it. Any, anyone else, does anyone else have any questions or thoughts? Sometimes it takes me a minute to type stuff out and I want my punctuation be correct. So I'm going to give you guys a couple minutes. Yes. And while they're doing that, 
Um, honestly, I hate to say this, that sounds a little, um, I'll say, but I'll just say it. You have a phone. Most everybody has a smartphone on them and they can set it. And every, you know, I, I start my timer over. Like one day I'm home, I was doing 20 minutes of this task, 20 minutes of household task, and 20 minutes of, um, meditation and prayer and my Bible time. And I just went 20 minute segments and the timer when it, when it went off, I got it from what I was doing and I went to something else and I got up and then I stopped, you know, and had some downtime in there. Um, eventually, cause I, I got tired of just going from one to the other. See, I didn't put a break in, but what I'm saying is, is you could set that timer for 55 minutes and 55 minutes it goes off. You stand up and set, you know, for five. I mean, there's tools we have. Um, there's even apps that tell you to stop and breathe. Um, so they're out there. And if not, look at the clock. And at the top of every hour, take five minutes. Top of the next hour, nine o'clock, I take five minutes. At 10 o'clock, I take five minutes. And just five, you know, it's not necessarily your, your I know you're at work, but again, your productivity is going to show in those other 55 minutes. Absolutely. Okay, well, I don't see any questions on the live on Facebook or on the, um, chat. Wallace, have I missed anything? Do you see anything? Maybe not. Okay. I want to thank everybody for being with us this evening. Um, I also want to remind you to please complete our host event survey. Tell us what other webinar you might be interested in. Um, Vaughn is a friend of many topics interest and skills. So we've talked about a few other potential webinars just as we're working on this social distancing thing. Um, but these are free opportunities to gain knowledge and learn resources in and around our community. So um, please reach to us via that survey and let us know what you're interested in. Um, even if you just want more information, maybe from Vonda about this topic or something else or anyone else. But on behalf of Families Helping Families at Southwest Louisiana and my friend Vonda Flew would like to thank you again for joining us for this webinar. Uh, it's going to send us some handouts that we're going to send to you in an email, but um, we hope that you have a great weekend and a uh, good evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.